from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of the program, Throwback Thursday, although I don't really got any throwbacks to talk about tonight, but we'll find some along the way. But lots to discuss. Our phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And man, if you're like uh, the rest of us, You've been watching videos of the aftermath of this hurricane, which is still going. But you've got lots of people, I think 3 million in Florida without power. A storm last night was downgraded to a Category 2. And um, I just, I got to tell you, some of the stuff I've been seeing on social media, and it has not been flagged as, as fake, phony, or fraud, right? Like some of the stuff that I know is real. But this stuff was wow. I mean, just really wow. There's a lot of, and I'm not saying it's fake. I'm just saying it is incredible to watch. The amount of damage, the storm surges, the flooding, the um, the, the height of the water and where it reaches. Just wow. Just really serious stuff. The darkness of the clouds. I've seen some storms, but, you know, never really been through, like I said, a hurricane other than Hurricane Sandy, which is, labeled a superstorm because so many different things were happening. And when you look at some of these things, these videos, it's wow. It's really, really something. Anyway, the, the, the big story today, or one of the big stories today, there's a holiday. It's called XX, which is the Roman numeral for 1010. And 1010 is Real Women's Day. Yep, Real Women's Day. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And there was something else I wanted to get to. You've got, oh, bear with me, bear with me. Ah, oh, let's see. 60 Minutes. I wanted to talk about this yesterday. I just couldn't figure out the right way to do it because it's so much better on, uh, on video. And if you saw it on social media, but I guess we could do it on audio. But there are apparently the sit-down interview that Kim Marais did a couple of nights ago, uh, Monday night. The uh, there was an edited question, or, and several I would presume. Uh, and one of them got out there, the question uh, on Netanyahu. And and you may have heard or seen this in the last couple of days, but what I found interesting is that we don't know the rest of them, right? We have no idea the extent of which sixty minutes ran cover in editing for Kamala Harris. Now I. You know, being in a broadcast business, you know, I tend to do a lot of out loud thinking. We're in real time, probably on a very minimal delay. And and there's no editing on, on live radio, right? So there's, you know, some editing, usually for clarity or cleanup or adding music or something like that on on uh, on a pre-recorded uh, show like 60 Minutes. Sure. But when I saw the before and after, and I think we have those audio clips um, Count Delacula, both the before and the after of Kamala Harris on 60 Minutes. It it was very dishonest, in my opinion, because you can be like me, for example, right? I, I got a lot of ums, a lot of ahs, a lot of long, pregnant pauses. I might say things in a circuitous manner at times, but I make my point, and I think it's pretty concise once it's done. And if you need to edit me down, you know, because you don't have three minutes for my long answer and you need to put it into a 15-second soundbite, then that's on you and you're editing. But that's not necessarily what they did with Harris, right? I mean, it, it, they really just tried to position her in the best light. Now, I, I would understand if she were an actress, a TV person, even a broadcaster. You know, you want to always put your best foot forward. But I found it interesting that, that 
the answer was, you know, kind of like, wow, it was like, you know, worlds apart here. <laughs> and she sounded more succinct and more confident in one answer versus the other. And I thought, you know, the American people should really see what happens. You know, when somebody calls here and disagrees with me, I give them an answer, whatever the answer is. If I don't know, I'll say I don't know. But I don't stop the tape and try and figure something out and and come back or fix it so that it's, you know, something other than what really happened. And I'm not saying she should compare to me. I'm just using me as an example because I live my life and I have myself at my disposal. But really just interesting to see how a news network and a news magazine program, right? 60 Minutes is a news magazine program, would actually do something like that. Now, I guess it shouldn't come as too much of a shock. Um, they've done it in the past. They did it to then-Governor Bush, who when he was running for president, Dan Rather. But man, you, you would think there'd be a little bit more of a shred of integrity there. Anyway, I want you to hear the before answer uh, when she was asked about um, Prime, Prime Minister Netanyahu from Israel. Listen to this. But it seems that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not listening. Well, Bill, the work that we have done has resulted in a number of m movements in that region by Israel that were very much prompted by or a result of uh, many things, including our advocacy for what needs to happen in the region. Okay. Now, this is the after. Go ahead. But it seems that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not listening. We are not going to stop pursuing what is necessary for the United States to be clear about where we stand on the need for this war to end. Isn't that something? Seemed confident, clear, concise. She didn't ramble. She didn't go around in circles. And it, it sounded decisive. That's not really what happened. And that's the part that I think is messed up. If, if you're going, if you're running for an office, this is not a, and even then, right? But it, this is not like an interview promoting a book where I don't really care how, what, type of speaker you are. If you're a good speaker, hopefully you'll sell more books. And you come on a radio or TV show and you promote your book, good for you. But ultimately, it's how good of a writer you are, right? How good is your book? But this, this is letting us into the window of her mind. How will you handle this type of conflict? How will you protect our nation? How will you honor our alliance with our strongest ally in the Middle East? This is a sham, right? This is fake, phony, and fraud, in the words of the immortal Bob Grant. This is one that we can't just turn a blind eye on. And Catherine Herridge, kudos to her. Uh, she used to be at Fox, and then she uh, went to CBS, and, and I, think, uh, I think she's not even at CBS anymore because she's a good reporter, and you know what they do with good reporters. But I think uh, she's asking the right questions. She wants to know what's the story here with, with Bill Whitaker and, and you know, and praises him. And I think we, we all think Bill Whitaker did a good job, right? Better than, than most were expecting 60 Minutes to do, in, in all honesty. But this issue with the two different edits is, is something else. And, and I think it's um, good on Catherine Herridge to be asking these questions and... Uh, and spilling the beans a little bit um, with respect to that. Because uh, she put out a tweet saying, as uh, the Trump campaign calls on 60 Minutes to release the full unedited transcript, uh, she says, there is precedent. When I interviewed then-President Trump in July of 2020, CBS News, uh, for CBS News, we posted the transcript. How about that? They posted the transcript back in July of 2020. So it's not unheard of to post a transcript of the candidate you're interviewing. In this case, the candidate is K. Maraides. But now there's an edited transcript if, you know, if they're going to be releasing it. And 
her comment here, she says it's about transparency and standing behind the integrity of the final edit. I think she's right. So good for her for standing up for the truth. That's ultimately what we expect everyone in the media to do. And Riley Gaines, I don't know if you remember her, the champion swimmer who really brought it to the woke movement. She's got a TV commercial out there taking it to Nike on something called Real Women's Day, XX. And we're going to do that coming up right now. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Whatever happened to I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar? What, it, what have we lost our minds? I sat here and listened to every, every label imaginable. I, I am here to protect women. Girls, my God, why do I have to apologize for that? We spent decades trying to protect women. And you know what? We won. We won. So I will not apologize now or ever for trying to protect my daughters and women in sports. And that's what this hearing was about protecting women. So you know what? I am a woman, and let me tell you, hear me roar, because I will not stop protecting women. You want to know why? Because we have rights, too. That's Congresswoman Lisa McClain, and Congresswoman McClain tweeted earlier today, on XX we celebrate hashtag Real Women's Day, and I'm proud to stand alongside strong leaders like Riley Gaines in the fight to defend women's sports. Title IX and women's sports need to be celebrated, not used as a pawn by the left in their radical gender war. Wise words from Congresswoman McLean and Riley Gaines is our guest right now. Riley Gaines, welcome back. Well, thank you, Richard. It's always good to be on with you. My pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I want to congratulate you on getting this thing off the ground and everything you've done to create this XX Real Women's Day. Uh, I want you to tell us, uh, for those of us who are just learning about it, uh, tell us what, what it is and how it came about. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to take you back to March of 2023, so a year ago. Uh, March, if you didn't know, is Women's History Month. And I watched this Women's History Month in 2023 as men were being awarded women's awards and nominations mm. and recognitions, whether it was from uh, I mean, I, I remember specifically sitting on my couch. I come from a family of, of athletes, professional athletes. My dad played in the NFL. And so ESPN was always on when I was a kid growing up. And so I'm sitting on my, my couch at my family's house. And all of a sudden I hear this female commentator, a, a commentator I actually really liked and respected. And then she goes into talking about this, this special they were doing for Women's History Month, this segment, and they began to honor – a man by the name of Will Thomas as this brave woman who has overcome so much persecution to achieve the seemingly impossible and winning a national title. Anyways, the list goes on, but I, I saw the harm in this and I began to brainstorm, how can we get back to honoring real women when it's a woman's recognition to be had? Uh, thinking, and I thought of October 10th, which is the 10th day of the 10th month, which in Roman numerals is denoted by XX. And if you took biology 101, then you know XX is the female chromosomes. Uh, and I thought, what better way to, to recognize and honor real women than on October 10th? And so that's how, that's the inception of this day. Uh, last year was kind of the first, the first year it was, I guess, technically celebrated. Uh, but it's been remarkable, the traction and the, the, men, the momentum that we have seen surrounding it both last year and this year. Well, happy Real Women's Day to you, Riley Gaines. And I, I think that's pretty cool. Now, what's the reception been like? I know you're talking about it growing, and uh, are you getting a lot of opposition, or are you finding more people saying, wow, this is pretty cool? We're getting a lot of support. Uh, I think even more so now compared to last year because 
people are more comfortable in stating what we all already know to be true, uh, that men and women are biologically and innately different. Uh, so the reception's been awesome. Um, we've had people posting in support. Even people like J.K. Rowling uh, posted about Real Women's Day today. It's it's really become a global uh, sensation, and so it's been awesome. Uh, both men and women have have really come out in supporting this this idea, this this initiative. Well, that's fantastic. And I mean, we've seen so much of this stuff since since the whole Leah Thomas thing uh, to to, you know, the the controversy, which you kind of spearheaded, I think, uh, uh, standing up for women. And uh, it continued right into the Olympics that just occurred uh, with the whole boxing stuff. It, it, it seems like it doesn't end Riley Gaines. No, it doesn't. And, and please understand it has really transcended far beyond even just sports. Uh, we are seeing how this movement has affected, I mean, sororities and, and prisons and even our language has just become entirely co-opted uh, co-opted to where it's no longer woman or female or mother no it's like cervix haver or uterus owner or menstruator or bleeder or chest feeder or birthing person or birth giver or egg producer or whatever other nonsensical Sick. phrase they can come up with um and so so you're exactly right it seems as if and that's because there really are no bounds to this movement, which makes sense when you think about what the, the, the premise of this movement is in denying objective truth. I mean, we should really all be asking ourselves if we're willing to, de- to deny man and woman, I mean, the most basic of truths, really, then, then what's next? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I know that I'm um, looking at the, uh, the piece in Fox News um, with you all over it, and, and it mentions... In 2022, the USA Today named Rachel Levine, uh, the the man President Biden appointed as U.S. Secretary of Health, as Woman of the Year. And and when he was in Pennsylvania, he was known as Richard Levine, Dr. Richard Levine. And and I say it with not laughing because I don't think it's funny. It's it's really incredulity, right? It's like, wow, I can't believe this is really a thing that's happening. Uh, what, what Where is their base of influence that you can get? Reputable or somewhat reputable, uh, you know, USA Today. They might be left leaning, but you would think that they want to hold on to their legitimacy and say, you know, we believe that men are men or women are women. What, what pushed people over the edge to think that it was okay to, to not acknowledge natural biology? I think a couple things. One, I think the idea of virtue signaling is, is certainly appealing to, to those in those, those positions, right? Being Mm. seen as kind and inclusive and compassionate. Again, more words that have just been hijacked and, and it conflated to mean uh, things other than their true intent. But I believe uh, what is behind a lot of this, and again, from every realm. So whether that's talking about the media, whether that's talking about why our government votes and, and responds in the way that they do, whether we're talking about corporate America or these academic institutions, the list goes on. I believe uh, even... Um, let me be I think it's important to mention even the the uh, medical community I believe these are are they're driven by money um, and dollar signs and that's become very very clear you know Riley Gaines is an old saying in politics it's always about the money and when it's not about the money it's about the money <laughs> folks are coming right back with Riley Gaines she's with us for another couple of minutes Uh, You remember Riley Gaines, director of the Riley Gaines Center at the Leadership Institute, and she's a host on OutKick. We're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. We are continuing our conversation with Riley Gaines. Uh, Riley Gaines is director of the Riley Gaines Center at the Leadership Institute, and she's a host on OutKick, and you know her uh, her show, Gaines for Girls, but you saw her in the media. She really uh, rose to the forefront of talking about her her swimming career and really standing up for, for real women and uh, launching this XX Real Women's Day. And that's fantastic, I think. And uh, I want to hear more about it as well as, you know, some of the obstacles you're facing. Riley Gaines, I can only imagine that while I think this is great, 
the critics on the left and elsewhere are likely coming at you, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, while I mentioned there really is a ton of support, support that far outweighs the negative, uh, that doesn't mean that, that the backlash and, and the negative does not exist, because it certainly does, um, especially on, on college campuses. Uh, I have, there's been a big push through the Rally Games Center to, to get on college campuses and to mobilize younger people, people of my generation, Gen Z, Gen Zers. Um, and even tonight, for example, I'm going to a university in California, which is, is, is really the belly of the beast here. Um, but there's a, a pride club, a drag club, a pro-Palestinian club who, who all have plans to protest the event and cause a ruckus and make a lot of noise and, and oftentimes even resort to violence that, that, we've, yeah. that we've seen. So um, the pushback is there, but it's, it's ironic uh, in the way that these are the same people that call themselves tolerant and accepting and welcoming uh, when in reality uh, they are quite the contrary. You know, Riley Gaines, I remember we had you on the show, I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe more, where you were uh, telling us about um, some, something similar, right? You were at a college and people were physically intimidating you and accosting you. Has that subsided? Does that remain to be a constant in, in the work that you're doing? Uh, unfortunately, it does. Um, it's. I, I feel like over the past, again, two years or so, uh, with more and more people who are willing to to be bold in stating the truth, um, it's caused the resistance to to go down a little bit, just because mm. they realize. I mean, there's really nothing they can say that dissuades from my argument that's rooted in logic or facts or reasoning or common sense or lived experience or science. What happened to follow the science? Uh, no, it's it's yeah. a lot of just name calling uh, or unfortunately violence. And you know. I- I, I think, look, from my perspective, right, I, I, I watch the news all the time. I follow these types of things. And I can tell you that it, it went from it being a non-issue where, you know, I have two little girls. They're bigger now, 19 and 23. But they were always girls, and they didn't face any of this drama that I think if I had a, you know, 9- or 10-year-old today, I'd, I'd be very nervous. But they they had a pretty decent life thus far. And then comes the last couple of years where, you know, it's everything goes nuts. And and I feel like you're right. There are more people now that are like, hold on a second. This isn't cool. You know, we have to stand up for what's right. And there's this uh, the detransition movement and a detransition day, which I think is great. And there's some great ambassadors for that out there. Do, do you feel that we'll get to a place where we once were, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago where this isn't a thing? Or is it going to be a, 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 a new thing that we have to battle in in life and in wokeness? Well, I mean, I, I definitely do believe that we'll have to fight for sanity, but that being said, I, I always believe that sanity will prevail. Uh, I believe that as someone who, uh, I mean, is a proud American and who believes that the American people will elect leaders uh, who represent us and our values, uh, but I think I say that more importantly as a Christian uh, and understanding that mm. the story's already been written uh, and we already know the outcome. And that's really why I have, uh, I'm, it just gives me the ability to do what I do with a smile on my face and an incredibly light heart, uh, because the outcome, it's its already been set in stone. Well, amen to that. Now, Riley Gaines, um, before we uh, wrap up, I want to make sure everybody knows about the work that you're doing now. Tell us about the Riley Gaines Center at the Leadership Institute. Yeah, well, like I said, it's been great. Uh, it's its what has allowed me to go on college campuses. Uh, There are other ambassadors for the center who are girls and women who have faced similar experiences to that that I did. Um, They're all on campuses today for Real Women's Day, speaking again to college students. Uh, But it's awesome. It's it's become this training program uh, that is able to provide resources and support and encourage uh, I mean, conservative leaders across the country, whether that's in, in the form of, I mean, school board leaders or community leaders right. or national right. leaders, what have you, uh, that is something this country is short of, is leaders. And so that's what we're doing at the Riley Gaines Center. Now, for people that want to check out your, your show, uh, Gaines for Girls, tell them what they could expect when they listen to it and when they tune in and what, um, how they actually access the show. 
Yeah, absolutely. You can find the show at outkick.com. Uh, all things games for girls there. Uh, but it's been super cool to be on the other side of, of the interviewing process and to be the one asking the tough questions. Yeah. We're talking to, again, people who have been impacted by the movement. We're talking to uh, legislators in D.C. at the state level. We're talking to, we just had Tulsi Gabbard on, I be- Tulsi Gabbard, and I believe this week we're having Senator Blackburn on. We're talking to world-leading scientists. I mean, really, really great and awesome people who are able to provide a lot of insight into not just this movement, but a lot of the cultural chaos that we're seeing plague this country. Outstanding. Well, let everybody know how they can follow you if they want to check out the work you're doing and keep up to speed with you. Uh, you can follow me on X, which is Riley underscore Gaines underscore. Again, be sure to check out RileyGainsCenter.org uh, or Outkick.com for all things Gaines for Girls. Outstanding. Riley Gaines, you are a gentlewoman, a scholar, and a patriot. Godspeed to you. Well, and thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, amigos, there is more to come straight ahead. We'll continue our discussion on this and everything else that's going on in America at night. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. For the best election coverage. All right, amigos, welcome back. Rich Valdez here with you live until 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Our phone number is 833-4825-337-8334, Valdez. And I want to get into a couple of things. I see some people on the line, and uh, I'm going to get to you momentarily as well. But earlier I mentioned something about uh, former President Trump and his um, demands for the release of a transcript of Kamala's uh, of her 60 Minutes interview. And what, what I found interesting here is that, of course, uh, CBS's own or former uh, reporter Catherine Herridge says that there is, in fact, precedent for that because she released the, the transcript of a interview that she did with former President Trump way back when she did it in July of uh, 2020. So it, it, to me, it begs the question, what is up with all this, right? What, what is the deal? Que pasa aquí? Well, president Trump was um, in Michigan, I believe in that, at the, let me see exactly where he was. He was at the Detroit economic club and he blasted this 60 minutes interview. Check this out. The other big news is the fraud committed by 60 Minutes and CBS, together with the Democrat Party, working together with them, which will go down as the single biggest scandal in broadcast history, I predict. It's a big story. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Happened. They learned about it yesterday evening. The real answer of Kamala was uh, very crazy or, or dumb. Nobody knows what, but it was bad. So they actually replaced it. Think of this. They've never done that for me. They've actually, they actually replaced it with another answer, having nothing to do with what she said before. They took another thing that she said and they just lopped it in there. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. 60 minutes, nobody's ever seen. And uh, they wanted to make her look as good as possible, make her look better. A big problem in our country is the fake news. We have such fake news. Yes, we do. We have such fake news. And let me tell you, if, if for nothing else, you have to absolutely praise Trump, give him all credit for really putting a microscope on how fake the news has been. You, you have to. When he came out and he said, you're fake news. I mean, it was brilliant, right? Brilliant marketing, almost as brilliant as 
a red trucker cap with the words Make America Great Again on it. Right? Who would have thought that would have become this iconic symbol of a of a movement that is I mean, it's it's redefined the dying Republican Party. It seems to be putting a nail in the coffin of the Democrat Party. It's genuinely a populist movement that is comprised of Americans of every stripe, uh, every stripe, every race, every creed. I mean, I, I, it's phenomenal, right? You really have to look at this in terms of how movements go. You have people that are are Bernie Sanders people that are on the Trump train. Remarkable. I don't think that ever would have happened with the Tea Party. Now, I'm not saying that that's exactly what I would prefer. If I had my way, that wouldn't be the case. I, uh, I'm not a populist. I don't promote populism. I'm not anti-populist. I just, it's not my thing. This isn't about rallying people behind common sense and things that we think are good. That's Trump's angle. My angle is about rallying people around liberty in America and understanding our Constitution and, and sticking to it. And I think those are important truths that we ought not to forget ever because I, I feel that we, we have gone away from them and largely because of this, this uh, emotion that people are wrapped up. You know, if you ever go to a, a Trump rally, He's been so incredibly effective at reaching people that some of the most vocal people that are the ones that are out there, you know, really the, his staunchest defenders, uh, some, not all, right? There's a lot of us that out there that, that really support Trump and have been with him since day one. But there are, there are many that will flat out tell you, I voted for Obama twice. And after I saw how this thing works, after I saw how Trump, kind of peeled back the onion a little bit. They, they've become so active in their support for Trump because it's not really about Trump, right? It's about the truth that's been revealed while he was saying, you're fake news. The fact that they can now look at things and they can do it with doubt. And this is not some sort of propaganda to get people to doubt the truth. This is actual truth to get people to doubt the propaganda. And that's remarkable. That's something I, I, I didn't think we were going to see. I didn't know that, but for reading book after book after book and, and understanding our country's founding and, and understanding the history of our media and, and the development and growth of our media and seeing where it is today and listening to talk radio and Limbaugh and Levin and Hannity and, and everybody else in between, would people be able to say, man, this media is corrupt and they're lying and they're shaping the truth that they want you to believe, the idea, the narrative they want you to believe, selling it as truth, their version of the truth. And Trump has come and I think he's done a remarkable job, really just truly, uh, it amazes me how many people really now just, they're just like, I don't buy a word of it. I don't buy a word of it. And good for them. Now, some people might think, well, that's the damage that's been done, Rich. We've now destroyed society. We now have created so much doubt that, that there is skepticism. There should be. It's not only is it healthy, it's necessary. We can't live our life thinking that Dan Rather has our best interest in mind when we know that he lied about uh, George W. Bush and his military service and, and that whole October surprise that they tried on Bush. We know that they lied now about President Trump, right? We, we know full well what the story is. Russiagate, or as Trump says, Russia, Russia, Russia. And he was right about that, 100% right about that. We know that they spied on him. They tapped his phone. They did X, Y, and Z. I mean, the, the whole thing is just, wow, right? It's just, wow. Hard to think that all this happened to an American president, a candidate then president. But here we are. So when Trump calls out 60 Minutes, guess what? Lots of people are on board saying, you know what, you're right. We now see the truth. We're not blind. Thank God for social media being able to juxtapose videos so you could see the truth. 
right? Amen. Because people have been having the wool pulled over their eyes for generations. I don't think the media lying to us and, and shaping the narrative like public relations experts is anything new. I think it's been going on forever. And we just took it as, yeah, that's, they're telling the truth. And, and in large part, we did by, by somehow delegitimizing people that were asking legitimate questions and saying that because you didn't go to J school or you don't work for one of the big three networks or because you don't work for one of the cable networks that we know or your cable network isn't on par with what we're used to or we don't like it or you're this or you're that. But it's a different day, right? New sheriff in town. Many new sheriffs. I think people are deciding for themselves where they're going to get their news. If they don't like Fox and they don't like CNN, they have Newsmax. They have One America News. They have Real America's Voice. There are options. If you don't like those, you find other options. But people have options. And when you have this competitive landscape, people could say what they want. They're peddling conspiracy theories. They're doing this and they're doing that. It doesn't matter. Because ultimately, people are going to vote with their eyeballs, what they're going to watch, where they're going to tune in. Some people are turning to podcasts and streaming programs on Rumble because they're tired of these people. People are tired of me. People are tired of all sorts of things. Some people are turning off the TV and only listen to me and others on radio. I say Godspeed to it all. Get as much information as you can and be an informed patriot. That's what Reagan called us to do. And I think that's some of the best advice we've ever had. Anyway, I'll continue uh, more on that as well as this professor who said we should shoot guys who don't think Harris should run for president. And he said it on tape, and then he got nervous that he got caught on tape saying it. I mentioned it, I think I mentioned it last night, but I didn't play you the clip of the audio or really get into it. So we'll get into that as well. Straight ahead, don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, to the phones we go, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Let's go to Yorktown, Virginia, to Joseph. Joseph, how are you listening to the show tonight? Hey, Mr. Valdez, I'm listening online. I just want to go ahead and say that I'm a big fan of the show. I appreciate what you're doing. And, um, you know, as an area captain for Trump, he spoke with us Sunday night in the conference call coming back from Butler, Pennsylvania. And two things he said in the call was he really appreciates us as working for his campaign. And he said that we need to get out and get people to vote for Trump. So I just wanted to go ahead and touch on that and say the gentle lady that was just on the phone, she posed an interesting question. When can we return to normalcy? Tampon Tim will have you believe that men are women and women are men. But I also want to know when we can return to normalcy as a country. Yeah, well, my, my hope is that it'll happen. Look, it took us a couple of years to get here, right? And I'm talking about pre-Trump, right? We've been on this decline. If, if you'll remember, we, we really started to go in a really radical left-hand turn when we started this war on police during Obama's administration. And it's kind of gone all the way. Trump held the line for a little bit, and they brought the riots and BLM. So I would say uh, um, four years of Trump plus another four years of another uh, conservative America first person, and we'll be on the right track, Joseph. Thank you for your call. Keep your foot on the gas, and Godspeed to you, brother. Folks, we're coming right back with the rest of your calls, more conversation on China and everything else. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. 
And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to hour number two of the program, our phone number if you want to join us this Thursday evening, 833-4825-337-8334, Valdez. And I want to discuss a couple of different things with you because uh, it's XX, which is 1010 in Roman numerals. It's the uh, Real Women's Day today, hashtag Real Women's Day. We talked about that with Riley Gaines in the last hour. If you missed that, make sure you check out the replay at richvaldez.com. But there's a lot more to discuss because, of course, uh, President Trump's campaign has been uh, demanding that CBS, excuse me, CBS News release the transcript of their interview with Kemalaitis, which uh, aired on Monday and yesterday came to light that they had did some doctoring. They, they doctored one, at least one of the answers we know about. We don't know how many of these uh, questions were ultimately doctored and whether this was... Um, you know, answers from other parts or, you know, how creative they got and how much more of it they did. And was there any AI involved? I mean, who knows, right? Once you start lying, you never know where things end and begin. So Trump was demanding that. And uh, we'll revisit that a little bit later. Uh, we also have Bram Resnick. He's a reporter doing an interview with Tim Walls on News 12 in Arizona today. Um, by the way, it, the Walls and Harris campaign are neck and neck with Trump, and in some cases he's beating them, in some cases uh, that they're, they're trying to make a resurgence, and um, the Hispanic voters seem to be the political football there. But the reporter tells him, hey, look, I keep hearing from voters that the economy stinks. What say you, Governor Walls? And listen to what uh, Governor Walls tells Bram Resnick. Let's talk about the state of Arizona battleground. One of the things I hear often from voters as I go around is, our economy stinks. Yeah. I know you hear it, and I spoke to, I asked Jay Pritzker about it a week ago, and he said the message isn't getting through. Does your campaign need to, need to change the message on the economy to reach the voters you need? Well, I think we just keep getting at them. Look, folks, no, if prices go up, housing becomes more expensive, and, and I've talked about this. You know, it doesn't spend, you know, spending time on that Donald Trump left a mess when he left. They want to know what we're doing right now, and I think what Kamala Harris is talking about making housing more affordable. Well, there you go. Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. Listen, if you are from the Midwest and you have a Midwestern accent, I love you, but I can't stand the way this man sounds. That, that, ah, I just can't do it. Sorry, I'm a New Yorker. I guess you probably can't stand the way I sound either. Anyway, Tim Walls, he's complaining about, you know, why the economy that his running mate uh, has shaped over the last four years uh, is not as bad as we think it is, not as bad as our pocketbooks tell us. Meanwhile, he says nothing to his friends in Tiananmen, right? Because Tiananmen, Tim Walls, is a lover of the Chinese. And again, I'm not a hater of the Chinese. I am a hater of the Chinese Communist Party and how they treat the United States and how they treat their own people. That's my issue. Tim Walls seems to think it's fantastic. Anyway, different topic for a different day. But speaking of China, China's got a lot going on right now in their own economy, right? They, 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 last year, the year before, and even recent years beyond that, they've had a lot of issues with building houses and finishing those houses and getting the financing to finish those houses. Uh, so now there's, there's a little bit of a crunch in China. And, and I want you to hear a report that we've got from our friends in Australia from news.com where they're now talking about an $850 billion stimulus package to rescue the Chinese economy. Listen to this. China's economy is in deep trouble, prompting the government to roll out a desperate $850 billion stimulus package to stabilize markets and reignite growth. This massive intervention comes as key pillars of China's economic engine, such as real estate, exports and urbanization, faltering, leading to a steep decline in growth. The stimulus package includes major liquidity injections into banks, mortgage rate cuts and stock market boosts. However, analysts warn that these moves may not be enough to reverse the long-term downturn. At the heart of the crisis is China's imploding property sector, which once fueled the nation's rapid expansion but is now a burden. 
The $60 trillion real estate market, making up 85% of household wealth, is deflating by 7% annually. Beijing has provided temporary relief by reducing mortgage rates and injecting cash into property developers, but has been clear that another construction boom will not be tolerated. So as that's going on, you've got the crackdowns on billionaires and businesses from real estate uh, tycoons to technology firms to finance companies. All of this has been accompanied by a socialist-styled messaging campaign about enduring hardship and striving for China's prosperity. Is that what America can count on here? I mean, I think this is crazy, right? Do they even have some celebrities in China that are now uh, being told to show off a little bit less online so that people don't get jealous? Now, loyal to the Communist Party, and this is being reported by the BBC, uh, loyalty to the Communist Party and country, lots of people are told what to do. And that obviously takes the place of a lot of things when you're looking at uh, Chinese society. So this is obviously not how we conduct ourselves or how we want to conduct ourselves, but this is how the Chinese conduct themselves. And I want to get some reaction to this and find out more about how we've got the Chinese influencing and infiltrating American tech companies because there's a lot going on and it's been going on, but I don't know if we put enough of a of a spotlight on it. So I want to welcome our guest, Jason Ho. He's the chief technology officer at uh, Techlium, and he's the author of the big plot book one, the return of the Phoenix. Now, Jason Ho was born in Taiwan. His father was a Chinese army colonel who led a military engineering force, uh, building supply lines over Burma's mountainous terrain to support U S forces that were fighting against the Japanese during world war II. And then he himself uh, came to the United States back in the 70s and uh, with the whole family. And and he's got a tremendous command on what's going on with uh, especially in the tech sector with this stuff regarding China. Jason Ho, welcome to the program. Appreciate. So let's talk a little bit. Yeah, of course. Let's talk about this, because I think. There's, like I said, I don't think that there's enough of an emphasis placed on how much influence and infiltration the CCP has on American technology companies. What's your assessment of that? First, I will talk about how China controls infiltrators. So China has two methods. One is to be called control. One is called change. Sometimes control is change, change is control. So how do they control? They use drugs and the human trafficking networks. Drugs so and human Party, trafficking. Wow. They deeply tie into the mafia around the world, not just in China. And second, what is change? They need to change our justice system. How they do that? They have infiltrate the attorneys, policemen, judges, prosecutors. Once they control justice, they can do whatever they like to change the society. And, and you're saying they're doing this all over the world. How are they doing it? Actually, they started in 1978 to found their founding father, one of the founding father, Deng Xiaoping, because my father's teacher was drawn by the founder of the Communist Party. So I had a chance to have insight, understand the Chinese Communist Party better. So I had to understand, actually, they are not a political regime. They, you can, the bad word can say they are parasite. And the good work can say they are ambitious, a group of people. They have no interest about whatever they do in China. Their focus is change the world. So we have to be very careful, understand techniques. If we think this is just a regular politics party, or we just think they are a country, we don't understand. They want to do is fundamentally change us. So have used the drugs and the human trafficking to do the control, and they use the justice system to do the change. And you said they're using the justice system or the drug business? The, the, the both. The both. The justice, I'm sorry, justice system to do the change. Because you control the judges, you control the prosecutors, and they do the yeah. ruling in your direction to, to the, destroy your society very easily. They let the murderers go. They let the rapers, people right. do the crime go. Yeah, they put, a, and the people want to fight for justice, fight good for the society, go to the jail. 
That's the purpose. This is a very simple way to ruin a society, to change a society. Wow. Folks, we're on with Jason Ho, Chief Technology Officer at Techlium. He's the author of the book, The Big Plot, Book One, The Return of the Phoenix. And we're going to come back and continue this discussion on how the Chinese Communist Party is causing so many of these problems, uh, how we can actually help liberate the people in China that are held captive by the CCP, and uh, exposing a little bit more of the Chinese Communist Party's technology spies. When we return, don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Mr. Call Screener, who is a budding radio star, by the way. Richie Valdez is terrific. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. And we continue our conversation with our guest, Jason Ho. And Jason Ho is the chief tech officer at Techlium. He's also the author of the book, The Big Plot, Book One, The Return of the Phoenix. And Jason Ho, we've been having a really good conversation. I mean, you're really um, helping me to understand things I under or suspected, but I understand a little bit more now how deeply the communist uh, Chinese have infiltrated several of America's institutions. And some of the topics that you discuss in your book, uh, we've talked about, you know, part of it is how the, the Chinese Communist Party is contributing to so many of the world's problems, uh, including here in the United States. But what about the the um, infiltration, or I should say, the the influence operations that they're running and getting their way in, whether through a back door or through outright theft, to United States technology companies? Tell us about that. China has made a decision since 1978. It is quite early before everyone understands the value of semiconductor. Deng Xiaoping ordered, there's a two technology sectors, semiconductor and communication. China must take control. And this is a one entity but the two faces. So we heard about Huawei. We understand Huawei produced the best communication systems. How that is possible? Because they have the support from Taiwan in the semiconductor sector in Taiwan. That's what China very good to do. They want to use Taiwan as a friend and China as our enemy to use duality to fool us. So they use semiconductor and the communication to infiltrate the technology. They planned it since 1978. We have to appreciate that they are inside. The future is going to be the communication, the semiconductor is going to be so important for every one of us. Yeah, and, and what do you think, how do you think this, um, I should say, how this continues, right? Because... You've got uh, journalists from different parts of the world, like including Japan, that have faced prison time because they've talked about and exposed Chinese spies and the theft of U.S. defense secrets. How do we combat that? Actually, we still have win of this battle because technology is the key. The U.S. has far better technology than China does. The only difficulty is because current the establishment in the technology world, those big companies, to try to prevent any new technology, any U.S. innovation to come to alive. We want to make sure China can dominate the, dominate the semiconductor, China can dominate the communication. So I think as long as American people understand the U.S. technologies, they are much better than Chinese one. And those technologies, unfortunately, doesn't have a chance to come up to the market. But I hope and the people can gradually understand supporting domestic development, and we have a good chance. And I have a good faith if the new administration can look at this issue, if they can support domestic innovations. And this matter actually can change hand immediately. Outstanding. Now, uh, before we wrap, I'd like you to to take a moment to kind of just walk us through the book and uh, – what, what inspired you to put this book together? Obviously, you're touching on a lot of very delicate topics, 
Uh, are you concerned about how uh, any backlash? I know oftentimes China will, you know, um, even American celebrities that have had involvement with China, when they say things they don't like, they let them know. Are you getting any heat from the CCP? You know, I said that they use justice system. First, I have got a phone call from Japanese prosecutors. Oh, wow. If I'm going to publish the book, they're going to arrest my partner. They're going to arrest me. And uh, they want to do whatever. They want to stop that this book being published. Also, they told me I've been threatened. Once the book is available from any book platform, and they will give us thousands of one-star reviews, make sure people does not buy my book and think this is uh, dangerous and uh, this is the very worst and, uh, and uh, the ever written about China knows nothing. So I'm prepared for those attacks. Wow. So how does that make you feel? What do you just don't care? You just say, ha ha, screw you. Or like, or are you concerned? Uh, definitely. I, I was lead designer for F-35 technology, the flight control and image display system. The thing oh, really? The China. We should have started with that. Yes. You designed a, a, a jet airplane, a fighter plane? The flight control and image display system. And uh, wow. I have my innovations. And uh, so I've been targeted by the CCP since 1996, the first day I signed NDA ah. with Lockheed Martin. So if you're, if you're designing so, uh, F-35s, writing a book saying that China's bad is it's kid stuff for you. It's, uh, I want people to know because I've been persecuted for 35 years. And wow. since I joined the program, and actually before I joined the program, they started targeting me. So I want to people to learn whatever I've learned to understand and what I've experienced. And I hope that information, that message can help everyone to see China better, to know how they play us, how they trick us, how they can manipulate us. Actually, they are paper tigers. <laughs> you think that's it? They're just paper tigers? You don't think they're the real deal? If if they are real dear, I won't be able to hear to talk to you and still talk about my book, right? <laughs> it's a long gone, right? <laughs> I love so it. I want know they are paper tigers. Don't think China is so serious. Once America understand that, we have much better chance. China is a threat, but it's not a serious threat. As long as we stand up, understand China's paper tigers, things will change dramatically. Oh, outstanding. Good perspective. Jason Ho, let everyone know where they can get a copy of the book and learn more about your work. Yes, my book has been stopped publishing for a couple of times because you know, they want to make mm-hmm. sure my book cannot be published. So I have to choose myself publishing. So I appreciate everyone's patience. I will have my book ready within a few weeks. Outstanding. Well, thank you, brother. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Keep fighting the good fight. You're a courageous man, and we appreciate it. Also, I want to be rich, you know. Oh my life, like everyone else. <laughs> Amen. The American way. Thank you, Jason Ho. And folks, we continue uh, with your calls and more, plus some conversation on the new movie, Get the Jew, The Crown Heights Riot Revisited. I remember that as a kid. I lived in Brooklyn at the time. So we're going to learn more about that with the um, the president and CEO of the movie, uh, I should say the film production company. Uh, When we come back, don't go anywhere, folks. It's me, Rich Valdez, and we've got more to come. and thank you for everything. I know you very well and I have, I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen and they love your show and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back. Amigos, we continue our conversation and I want to talk about a little bit of a throwback. I remember I said it's Throwback Thursday and, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, Ocean Avenue, Avenue M, Relatively mixed neighborhood, but a big Jewish population. And Crown Heights was, you know, not that far away, 15, 20 minutes from where I lived. You know, my brother lived on Avenue K right off of Flatbush Avenue. And I was always in that area. And I remember when this thing happened, it was a scary time, right? A lot of craziness in the streets. And again, not necessarily right where I lived, but we went places. We did grocery shopping up that way, and we would pass it often. 
and and it was all over the news and you couldn't escape it and it was really just a, a horrible time you know it was really um just something else and i don't know if people who lived outside of new york really could grasp what was going on because you know you weren't there you could just see on the news if it was being reported and at the time a lot of the rioters were allowed to just do whatever they wanted because the um the mayor uh, who preceded giuliani david dinkins he he believed uh in in all his riots uh, all the riots he presided over he believed that you needed to um let them vent and uh it was a marked difference obviously when rudy giuliani became mayor but just um an interesting time an interesting time so we've got a, a clip of a trailer from the film that i just mentioned before get the jew the crown heights riot revisited uh, this is a film uh, by uh, Michael Pack and Palladium Pictures. Listen to this. Crown Heights torn by violence. Someone with a gun is on top of a building, firing at will. Three nights of violence in Crown Heights. The worst anti-Semitic race riot in American history happened in 1991 in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. A young Hasidic man was stabbed to death. Black protesters chanting Heil Hitler. A Hasidic man hit by a brick on Eastern Parkway. Why did it happen? And why did it go unchecked for three days? It was very dangerous out here tonight. So there you have a part of a uh, piece of the trailer. And uh, I want to get some... Um, some of the scoop on this from the president CEO of Palladium Pictures, Michael Pack. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be on your show. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. And tell me a little bit about why you decided to make a film about the Crown Heights uh, riots now. Well, first of all, Rich, this is the first of a series that my company, Palladium Pictures, is doing with the Wall Street Journal opinion section. And it's the goal of the series we hope to do three, four, five a year, every year, to look at incidents and events of the recent past that have been misreported or misunderstood or simply down the memory hole. And this one seemed like a good one to start with um, because anti-Semitism is on the rise today. And if you want to understand it, it's good to look back to the Crown Heights riot in 1991, which was the worst anti-Semitic riot in American history. And it's a pattern that's repeated itself to the present. Yeah, lamentably. Uh, we, we've seen it uh, repeat itself uh, viciously. Uh, walk us through a little bit of this, because for everybody who's not familiar and what they didn't glean from the trailer, uh, I think there's a lot of people who, A, either had never heard about the Crown Hunts riot, or some that are going, oh, yeah, I remember that. So uh, right. refresh everyone's memory. I, I do think you're right, Rich, that unless you lived in Brooklyn, as you did, or, or, or lived in New York City around that time, you probably don't remember it. And even the people who did live through it might not remember it well. And so, I mean, mm-hmm. that's why we told the story. I mean, especially in other parts of the country, Nebraska, Washington State, Texas, I, I think it's uh, down the memory hole. Um, so, I, and I, I want to encourage your listeners to actually watch the film. It's only 20 minutes. It's for free. It's on the Wall Street Journal website, but it's not behind their payroll. It's free. And if they go to WSJ.com slash opinion, they can scroll down to the videos and see it. Uh, Wow. I didn't know it was free. That's fantastic. Free. So I just think it's important for people to see. So it's not behind the paywall. So, so, you know, just to to give the the bare details of it. So it was a... As you were saying, I think already a little bit, the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn was a mixed neighborhood, but it, but a, a difficult neighborhood of Brooklyn. It had been once all Jewish, but a lot of black people moved in, and many of the Jews, Jewish people, went to you know Scarsdale or Staten Island or somewhere, or Long Island or somewhere else, white flight. But one group of Hasidic Jews stayed, Chabad Lubavitch. And their grand rabbi, the Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson, who fled the Nazis, said, we're going to stay. Uh, we can live with these people. This is our home. We're staying here. So over the years, it developed. There was tension between them, but, they, but 
And this is, you probably remember, a, a violent time in New York, the, the 70s and 80s. There was a lot of street crime. And, and then, right before this incident, there was a lot of black nationalism sort of whipping up black Jewish tensions, Louis Farrakhan, most famously. But right before the Crown Heights riots, um, in fact, Leonard Jeffries, who is the uncle of Hakeem Jeffries, um, the uh, minority leader of the House, said, you know, got it, was very, made many controversial comments that were, I think, clearly anti-Semitic. He referred to white people as uh, black people as sun people and white people as ice people. And, you know, they're, they're like virtually separate nations. Jews were responsible for the slave trade. Jews were responsible for all the ills of America. It got, you know, he was head of the African-American history department at city university. He, he was calls for him to resign. And so there was a lot of that in the air. And then on a hot summer night, the, the, a, a, a tragic incident occurred. The um, grand, the Rebbe, who I mentioned earlier, who was a famous religious leader, every month went to visit the grave of his wife and his predecessor. And he, he was coming back from that visit. He had a police escort because he was a famous religious leader. And it was a police. It was a three-car motorcade, police in front with sirens and lights flashing. Then. Um, Rabbi Schneerson's car, and then finally the car with his assistants. And they went through a light. The, two, the two, first two cars went through, and the third car ran either a yellow or a red light, hit another car in the intersection, careened off that car, and pinned two young black children who were playing on the street against a wall, Gavin and Angela Cato, and tragically, Gavin Cato died. So this is clearly a, a tragic traffic accident, 8 p.m., on this hot August night. But right away, people in the crowd whipped up a frenzy, especially this guy, Charles Price, saying he did it on purpose. The Jews get away with everything. We, sh we can't let this happen. And it turned into a riot. And gangs of black youths went to the neighborhood looking for stores to loot and cars to burn. And three hours later, they ran into a young Hasidic student, doctoral student, Yanko Rosenbaum, and said, there's one, get the Jew, hence their title. They right. beat him, and they stabbed him, and he died. And that was night one of the riot. And it, the next day, Al Sharpton came, others came from outside, there were protests, there were marches, there was more violence every night, and it went on for three nights. And there's, as the as you heard our narrator say, the question was, why did it go on so long? And why did the mayor, David Dinkins, fail to stop it? When finally, he himself and his police chief, uh, Lee Brown, were themselves attacked. Then they decided to end the riot. They turned to their deputy police chief, Ray Kelly, asked him to end the riot and ended three hours later. So there's this question, why did it not end? Why did the newspapers report it poorly? What happened? And so that's the story we 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 tell in our film. Well, what a story it is, and you tell it really well. Folks, we're on with Michael Pack. He's the president and CEO of Palladium Pictures. And again, recounting the, um, the, the story of the Crown Heights riots, and it really was quite a time. Uh, again, as I was a little kid, and I remember just seeing this on the news on a regular basis. And uh, growing up in Brooklyn adds this you know, this nuance where you're surrounded by a bunch of different people. You know, I, I know when I moved to Jersey, it wasn't like that. But mm. as a kid, I, there was a kid next to me. His name was Osama Marrero. His mother was Dominican. His father was an Arab. Uh, there mm. was another kid next to me, Stan Hope Ellis. And, and like, you know, in kindergarten, we had little mats we had to lay down for like nap time. Stan Hope was a huge kid. He looked like he was in fifth grade. He was in <laughs> second grade. And a Haitian kid, very nice guy. Uh, on the other side of me, Mark Schulman, Jewish kid. Nice kid. These kids were very good friends of mine. Then Russian Jew, uh, Ralph Schulberg. And, and this was the, the mix that was around. Jessica Maldonado, uh, Deborah Turner. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, you know, just everybody. Kids were coming in from Flatbush. Kids were coming in from, from um, further in Midwood. And it, it was just, that's how I grew up, with all sorts of people around me. So it, it was an incredibly diverse experience for me. Uh, fast forward some years, I moved to Jersey. And it's a very segregated neighborhood wherever you go. 
uh, in, in Jersey. Go to the sections of Newark. There's a Puerto Rican section of Newark. There is a, uh, a, a, um, a, a Jewish section in Union City. It, everything was kind of segmented, and it was odd to me because the schools were zoned and there was no busing like there was in Brooklyn, so everybody went to a school they could walk to. And henceforth, you could, you know, if you lived in, let's say, Hudson County, West New York area, the chances of you going to school with a black person, very limited because everybody mm. was Hispanic there. And that was never the case in Brooklyn. So, um, you know, you, when you saw this riot going on, you're like, wow, I can't believe these people are, are at each other's throats. And at the time, I thought it was because of the cultural differences, not because of the real backstory about the accident and, and Yanko Rosenbaum and all of that. Uh, you know, all I knew was, you know, the black people and the Jews are killing each other. And, and it was it was just crazy carnage in the streets, uh, at least in my mind. So we're going to continue that story with Michael Pack. <clears throat> Excuse me. Straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-4237. 833-482-4237. For Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Across America to the liberty loving Latino Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Some black leaders accused the Jews of getting preferential treatment from the city. There is a double standard, the standard in which the police act treat people differently. And, and there's a double standard with respect to services, how services are rendered, what people receive, goods and services in this community. This tension had been building, and on top of that, it was the summer. It was a hot summer of 1991. So it was a powder keg. What happened on that night in August 1991 was um, someone lit a match, and the place exploded. There you have another clip from the film. Uh, by Michael Pack, and what a what a time it was to be alive. Let me tell you again: the film "Get the Jew: The Crown Heights Riot," a uh, Crown Heights Riot Revisited, which is available free on the Wall Street Journal website. Uh, just do a Google of that Wall Street Journal "Get the Jew," and uh, it should bring you right there. And again, available free. Um, not every day that we promote a film that is uh, free, <laughs> right? So definitely watch it, Michael Pack. So. What's the reception been like since you've released the film? Well, I mean, we, as I mentioned earlier, we did, we did make the film because of this resurgence of anti-Semitism in America. But in fact, it's been more relevant than we would have wished. So people are very, people are very interested in it. I think people do see the connection. I mean, at the time during the Crown Heights riot, people were counting, chanting, hail Hitler and, Hitler didn't finish the job, clearly anti-Semitic. But you see now a kind of anti-Zionism where people are saying from the river to the sea. And it's, it, and, but Jews are again being terrorized. And so it seems to be repeating itself. So people are, I think, very engaged and interested in it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a sharp contrast from the picture you, you, you painted a while ago of growing up in a mixed neighborhood where I grew up in Manhattan. Also, I saw, I grew up, went to elementary school with kids of all kinds, you know, blacks and Hispanics and Jews. And there wasn't this tension, but it got whipped up in that moment in Crown Heights and it's being whipped up again on college campuses. So, uh, you know, I, and, and, and once again, people have to stand up when natural tensions or even unpleasant slogans turn into violence and intimidation and that's what failed to happen in crown heights after even a murder and i see it on college campuses there are pe the, the film ends with a jew a hasidic jew being stabbed once again in crown heights just a month ago by someone shouting free palestine and do you want to die luckily that particular man 
you know, did, was not killed and is doing fine, but the attention was the same. So I think there's a, a high degree of interest in it, um, for not always for great reasons. Michael Pack, what is, um, I guess, your, your, your goal for, uh, for the film? I know you want to uh, kind of highlight what, what it was like historically, and we are definitely in a time of, uh, of renewed anti-Semitism, or I should say uh, it's become somewhat acceptable in, in many ways, uh, lamentably. What, what's your end goal for putting out this film? Uh, what type of social change are you looking for, if, if that's the goal at all? Well, you know, this is a series with the Wall Street Journal opinion section, as I mentioned, to come up with stories that are neglected but are important. And I believe that you can change people's minds by film and media. I mean, that's why I do it. You are in the media, too, which, of course, you must feel that way as well. So I hope people watch it. And We are particularly focused on making films. I mean, we are conservatives, right-of-center people, and we want to do the stories that the rest of the media with a different perspective, maybe have neglected or not covered fully. So, but we want to tell the story in a straight, fair, fact-based manner. It's true we're working with the Wall Street Journal opinion section, but we want to tell it from all sides. We interviewed Al Sharpton. He was gracious enough to be interviewed. We give him, I think, a very fair hearing here and a chance to make his case. So we, we feel strongly that by telling the story straight in a fact-based manner, what happened those three days, it's more interesting to viewers than being beaten over the head with what they should do or a call to action. And I think in the end, it's more convincing. So I hope people watch it. I hope that they encourage other people to watch it, perhaps people that they don't necessarily agree with them and, and maybe, you know, doesn't share, don't share the, the views even of the Wall Street Journal opinion section. So I, I hope that, they, that people get other people to watch it and think about it. So that's that. That's that's my goal with it. And then, of course, I hope they watch future films in the series. Well, folks, check it out at uh, PalladiumPictures.com, PalladiumPictures.com. Michael Pack, I want to thank you for being here and sharing this with us. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot, and Godspeed to you. Thank you very much, Rich. Good you bet. To you. My pleasure. Likewise. And, folks, we're coming right back. We're going to gear up for open phones across America. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, and I wanted to uh, play a clip for you. It's a little tight here, so I'm not going to get to it. But this professor, he gets up there and he starts just running at the mouth saying things. And then he says, oh, man, are they recording this? Oh, I hope they're not. It's like a live stream of his class. And then he's like, don't put it in the live stream. After he said, you guys that don't think Kamala Harris could be a good president, you should be lined up and shot. Yep. That's what he said. This guy's from Kansas. And uh, he got in a world of hurt. I think he's in a world of hurt. If not, then he should be, right? Who talks like that? Anyway, and if I said something like that, I'd be in big trouble. Hot water. Ay, bendito. Anyway, folks, we're coming back. It's open phones across America. We're kicking it off right now. I see you guys lining up for the phones. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. I'll be right back. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez.
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to our number three. It's the Thursday night edition of the program. We're live, we're national, and our phone number is 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And if you want to join us, feel free to give us a call. Uh, it's open phones across America. And open phones across America, as I often um, remind you, is a tradition started by the late Larry King back in 1978 and uh, something he continued during his tenure with the program. And then the late, great Jim Bohannon continued for three decades beyond that. And now you and I continue that tradition right here, live and national, 833-482-5337. And here are the ground rules. There really aren't much, right? I mean, keep it clean, you know, no hitting below the belt. But uh, actually, you could do whatever you got to do. We could talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, it's all fair game to me from, honestly, it could be politics, it could be entertainment, it could be just about anything. Uh, I'm always interested in learning about things I don't know and anything we have talked about, right? That's all on the table as well. And we've had a lot of discussion tonight, whether it was the Crown Heights riots, uh, we talked about the infiltration of the Chinese Communist Party into American culture. And, of course, we talked about XX Real Women's Day. And I want to start with that. Uh, Riley Gaines, she put together a little TV commercial through the Riley Gaines Center uh, where she was basically calling out Nike, saying that we must really rise and do it, right? Is it really just do it when it's just uh, men or do you defend women as well? And uh, I want you to hear this little TV commercial that Riley Gaines put together to celebrate XX Women's Day, Real Women's Day it's called. And the reason they call it Real Women's Day or XX is because they decided to do it on October 10th. And that's the Roman numeral for October 10th. And we had Riley Gaines on a little bit earlier. And if you missed that interview, make sure you check it out at richvaldez.com. Uh, every day there's a, a replay of the show on the website as well as a podcast that you can, uh, you know, always go back and reference. But listen to this. Dear Nike. Dear Nike. Dear Nike. Why won't you stand up for me? Why won't you stand up for me? Why won't you? Why do you claim to support women and girls? Yet when we need you most, you remain silent. Today, males are claiming our identity. Our sports. Our spaces. Men and boys are stealing opportunities, medals, trophies, and our future. And it's not fair or just. In fact, it's often dangerous. Yet you refuse to use your platform to stand up. You say you're for social justice and progress. So why do you allow men's rights to come before ours? See, with a big platform comes an even bigger responsibility. You have a chance to do the right thing, not just do the easy thing. So we're asking you, Nike. So we're asking you, Nike. So we're asking you, Nike. As the biggest voice in all of sports. Will you stand up for me? Will you stand up for me? Will you stand up for me? <laughs> Will you stand up for me? Will you? Will you? Will you just do it? And, of course, this is uh, a powerful, powerful ad that was released by the pro-woman apparel company XXYY Athletics. Riley Gaines is a brand ambassador there. And they released this viral new video celebrating October 10th as Real Women's Day, calling on Nike to stand up for women and girls in sports. Now, this ad, very powerful features 10 girls of different ages asking why Nike won't stand up for them. And it's a little girl, big girls. I mean, the ages are varied. They go on to say, why do you claim to support women and girls? And I think you heard that right now. And why are you remaining silent? And it's true. You know, part of what they talk about is how males are claiming the, the female identity today in sports and in culture and so many different ways, in bathrooms even, just ask Tiananmen and Tim Walls. And these opportunities are being stolen from girls who, you know, historically had a fight to get to where they are. Different medals, trophies, and really the future of, of these sports, I think, hangs in the balance. It's, it's been imperiled. Why? Because of this woke culture where we just want to allow everything to be whatever people feel like it and, and not what it really is. So they call on Nike saying you're, you think you say you're for social justice and progress. Why are you allowing men's rights to become more important than women's rights? It's a great question. 
Very, very good question. It's a very, very powerful ad. Uh, so kudos to all of them, um, from Riley Gaines to XXYY Apparel and everyone in between that was responsible for putting that out there. And, uh, of course, I want to get your uh, reactions to that and everything else we're talking about. Now, I teased a couple of times, and I'm going to go to it now, this uh, professor, right? Because while Nike's saying nothing and they're being silent, you've got a professor in Kansas that is raging against men, right? So here you have Riley Gaines saying, look, don't let men come into women's sports, which I think is fair. But now you've got a professor saying that we should be shooting men if they don't support Kamala Harris, or as I like to call her, Kamala Harris. Now, this is very, very interesting. He says, line line all those guys up and shoot them. I mean, yeah, I'm not making it up. That's a quote. Listen to this. Guys are smarter than girls. you got some serious problems. Uh, that's what frustrates me. There are going to be some males in our society that will refuse to vote for a potential female president because they don't think females are smart enough to be president. We could line all those guys up and shoot them. They clearly don't understand the way the world works. Did I say that? Scratch that from the recording. I don't want the deans hearing that I said that. Yeah, too late, brother. I think we have uh, north of 6 million listeners, and I think they all heard it right now. (laughs) Anyway, and this is a University of Kansas professor who's now on leave after this video surfaced uh, last night. I mentioned I just never played the video, um, the audio of it for you. Uh, This is him, you know, musing to his class that we need to put these people up against the wall and execute them if they won't vote for Kemala Eris. And let me tell you, this guy... Big pendejo, right? He says uh, th- this frustrates him, and and he's just all over the place. But the guy's name, Philip Locock, L O W C O C K, Philip Locock, and Mister Locock, uh, you know, goes on to say, "Did I say that?" and whatever, and and now he's in, you know, it's, he's in a world of hurt. I would presume he's a lecturer in the Department of Health sports and exercise sciences. And I don't know, um, you know, what the outcome is going to be. I would presume once we stop talking about it in the media, he will, um, and not that I consider myself part of the media, by the way. Um, I think I'm outside on the outskirts, you know. But once once this is done and it's made its flash in the pan, maybe they'll say, all right, here, you're back. Your three-day suspension's over, you know. Hope you enjoyed your time with your kids or whatever it is he does in his free time shooting people, whatever it is. So um, that's Mr. Philip Locock for you. This is what we're dealing with, a movement that wants to erase women from women's sports and another movement uh, within the same movement that just wants to erase men who won't vote for Kem Malaeris. You tell me what's going on with the left wing of our American political system. It doesn't look good. Anyway, folks, your calls and more are coming up. I see we have calls from Montana, Ohio, Florida, and more are coming in. The phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. America at Night, your home for the best election coverage. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. And the reason some people think, well, I don't know, I remember that economy when he first came in being pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good because it was my economy. We had had 75 
straight months of job growth that I handed over to him. It wasn't something he did. I had spent eight years cleaning up the mess that the Republicans had left me the last time. So just in case everybody has a hazy memory, <laughs> that, that, that was, he, didn't, he didn't do nothing except those big tax cuts. All right, so that is President Barack Obama, the 40, what was he, 44th president of the United States. And he says Trump didn't do nothing. That was the Obama economy. If that's how it's going to work, why ain't he running for president? I don't see anybody trying to get him in. He's not filling up any stadiums. Come on. We know this is fake, it's phony, and it's fraud. That's the bottom line. He criticized Trump and said, what is he going to do, wave a magic wand to get some manufacturing back, to do this, to do that, to get the automakers to do whatever? Trump did his thing. Now, he didn't create the um, 1980s manufacturing economy in the United States. No. I don't know if that ever comes back after what Clinton did to allow China into the driver's seat of the manufacturing economy. But the point here is clearly that Obama's trying to take credit with, I think, who he perceives to be his base in that room that are going to clap for him when he says that. But the rest of Americans know the real deal, right? Even the ones that don't like Trump know things are better with him, 100%. Anyway, I want to know what you guys think of everything we've been talking about tonight. We've talked about the Crown Heights riots, uh, the attacks on the Jews. We talked about women in men's sports or men in women's sports, I should say. And the infiltration of the Chinese Communist Party in American institutions. And that, that's uh, the one for me that I think is most concerning. But let's go. Let's go to the phones. 833-482-5337, 833-4-Valdez. Let us go to uh, Walter. He's in St. Augustine, Florida. W-F-O-Y, Walter, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. Hola, Rich. Hola. I, I, hola. I think your guest about um, the Jew hate was wanting really to stir up emotions against the evil of picking on Jews. Do you remember when you wrote on the D train coming into Manhattan on the Manhattan Bridge? Um, the Absolutely. The large apartment complex? Yeah. Yep. The, the D and the Q oh. were the two trains I took the most. Okay, there you go. And um, well, right there is where I grew up. And these punks would always take the yarmulkes off these poor, innocent Jewish boys just trying to go to school, whatever they, wherever they were going. And, uh, you know, that stirred me up. You know, I've been pretty tough not to brag, but I would defend the Jewish boys because I realized the evil that had to be defended against that. And But I also realized something else, Rich. Who was a What's Jew? Jesus, Jesus Christ. That's right. Yeah. That's so true. And, you know, I, I think about that every day. And, and, and it's, it's, I guess I've always had a bias towards the Jews for the Jews because I grew up amongst the Jews. Uh, and in my thinking, you know, if Jesus was a Jew and I'm a follower of Jesus, at least, you know, trying every day to be the best one I can be. I mean, sometimes I don't try so hard. I'm, I, I fail and I fall short. But the point is, if, if, if those are our people, then why are we, um, you know, why are we ostracizing them or alienating them or buying into some of these crazy theories where, you know, I, I get calls sometimes and people say, oh, you know, it's because of the Jewish bankers or, you know, just there's so many crazy things. And just because there may be people, you know, a couple of bad apples within a bunch, you, you don't throw away. You, you've got some Catholic priests that like to rape little kids. Nobody, nobody I know is running around saying, oh, those Catholics, boy, they love raping little kids. I, I, how could anybody say such a thing, Right. But somehow it's acceptable if you say, oh, those Jews, they like to do whatever. You can't lump everybody. You can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And, and at least that's what I think, Walter. Yes, I agree with you, Rich, 100 percent. Now, let me ask you, Walter, switching gears a little bit. You're in St. Augustine. Were you affected greatly or at all by the hurricane? No, we just got a lot of rain and, and a lot of wind. And we're on the, we're on the east side. Uh, um, yeah, the east side and the west side was where the, the hurricane started. By the time it got here, it was pretty much depleted. So we were okay, Rich. Thanks for asking. 
thank God, thank God. That's uh, that's uh, you know one of the things that I think we're always thinking about right now is what what the deal is with that because so many people have been um, affected in such a serious way and it's just it's been brutal. Now, did you hear the clip on Obama, Walter? What are your thoughts on 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 the um, comments Obama made that you know this was his economy? And again, I. I There were uh, times in the Obama economy that were up. There were times that were down. But he's saying that Trump um, didn't do anything and that he just rode on his coattails. Yeah, it's just another life, you know, another part of um, the rhetoric and what they're trying to do to uh, Trump. It's another way of attacking him all is. Yeah, Trump did a lot. And, and it, yeah, I guess Obama did something, you know, but look at all he did with the, with the money, giving it to Iran and, you know, and so on and so forth. He did a lot of bad things, too. With the money, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. We're giving away pallets of cash, giving them back the money that was taken from them through sanctions to keep us safe, and then saying that uh, you know JCPOA was a good idea. I think you're spot on there, brother. Thank you, Walter, for your call. Shout out to everybody listening in St. Augustine, Florida, on WFOY, and uh, we're going to continue. Let me see. Where do I go from here? Uh, I guess we'll go to the other side of the country very quickly to Martina. She's calling us from Port Angeles, Washington. Hi, Martina. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, I told uh, you already before, uh, shortly, my husband was 1991 uh, making for Schwarzkopf Desert Storm and all the things on uh, 2000. We need cash to check. Uh, uh, Martina, I'm having a tough time hearing you. What are we talking about here? Talk just a little bit louder if you can. It is about, it is about the military, you know, and he worked for them on uh, making a desert storm, 1991 for Schwarzkopf, and uh, the, the promise was a colonel salary. You know, let's put Martina on hold. I'm sorry, Martina. It sounds like there's a lot of air there. I, I, can't, I can't make out everything that you're saying, but I appreciate it. And hopefully we can get a clearer line for you. And uh, let me see, where else do I want to go? Uh, we can go ahead and check in. Well, that won't be enough time. What we'll do is we'll leave everybody right where they are. We're going to come right back. This way you have enough time to actually say what you want to say. The phone number is 833-482-5337. If you want to join the conversation, we only have less than a half hour to go. That's uh, two, maybe three more segments tops. The music means they're kicking me out. But again, the number 833-482-5337. It's open phones across America. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. And again, we have calls from Arizona, Washington State, Montana, Ohio, and more. 833-4-VALDEZ is the number. Coming right back to your calls and more. Don't move a muscle. Your ratings are up. Congratulations, Thank everybody. You, it's always nice to check. I like to see, <laughs> even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing. Are people listening, right? That's but right. But you're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, welcome back. It's Rich Valdez. I'm with you live until 1 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, We got about 30 minutes left in the show, a little less than that. And I want to play a clip for you before we get to the rest of your calls. 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Alejandro Mayorkas, he's the Secretary of Homeland Security. And today he decided he didn't feel like answering questions about what was going on in the real world because he was busy dealing with hurricane stuff and said, no, 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 I'm not going to answer any questions from the press corps. Jackie Heinrich from the Fox News Channel very um, pointedly asked some very specific questions that I think she deserved an answer to. I think the American people deserved an answer to. He's a public servant, and we we look to him for these answers. However, um, he said, 
I'm not doing it. And as more as many times as you ask is as many times as I'll give you the same answer. Listen to this. I want to ask you about a different story. This Afghan national who was working for the CIA in Afghanistan was arrested for planning an election day terror plot. Um, he was brought to the U.S. after Afghanistan collapsed. Your agency says as part of the SIV program. The State Department is telling us he was not part of the SIV program, which had strenuous vetting. Uh, they say he was never issued an SIV or immigrant visa, and DHS paroled him into the U.S. They further expect the court document to be updated to reflect this from the DOJ side. So, Mr. Secretary, how was this man brought into the U.S.? What screening did he undergo? What did he apply for to get here? Jackie, I, I'm here in uh, North Carolina. Um, uh, communicating with the individuals who are still conducting search and rescue operations. Over 200 people have lost their lives in Hurricane Helene. We have uh, reports uh, that at least 10 individuals have lost their lives as a result of Hurricane Milton. I'd be very pleased to answer your question in a different setting, but we are here to talk about it emergencies and the support that we can deliver to people in desperate need. I Thank you. That, Mr. Secretary, but we're getting conflicting answers from your agency and from the State Department about a man who was arrested for an election day terror plot. How do you not have those answers prepared? Oh, um, uh, Jackie, that's uh, not what I said. What I said is I'd be pleased to discuss uh, this issue at a different time, but I am here to speak about disasters that have impacted people's lives in real time, and that is the subject that I'm addressing today. Mr. Secretary, can you assure people that appropriate steps have been taken to secure the country against these kinds of threats? Because the outstanding question is whether this man was radicalized before the U.S. government brought here, him here or afterward. And people should be concerned Jackie, about that. Jackie, Jackie, your persistence in questioning can be matched by, by my persistence in answers. <laughs> what a baby. Right. This is a woman who's who's paid to ask questions, to be the watchdog of the American people. And she's doing her job. seems like a handful of people actually do their job. And he just refuses. He simply won't answer. I think he should be ashamed of himself. But this is what we've got. Right. This is who we have. Anyway, to the phones we go. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDES. And let us check in with Pat. In Sedona, Arizona, streaming the show on richvaldez.com. Pat, what do you think about Alejandro Mayorkas here? Well, you know, that's typical because, you know, I heard, <clears throat> excuse me, I heard that, I mean, t 20, maybe 10 people have died. I mean, there's so many numbers. I have friends in Fort Myers, and I have finally got a hold of them. The cell phone service is, is good and bad and they said you talked about the the way they talked about their town being flooded to the you know like every roof every everything was flooded to the roof he says it looked like about eight or nine inches down down the down the streets and he says that's that's not good but he says they're they're really propping up this disaster a lot more he said there are people kill, been killed and that's sad but this is just like COVID, it's the misinformation and not giving people straight information about what is important to Americans. And by the way, Rich, there's one thing I wanted to talk about Obama's economy. 2% growth in the eight years he was there. It was anemic growth. Now, he gave, uh, he did give Trump no bad debts, but look where we are. I mean, I tell you, it's misinformation by this government, and Obama should be ashamed of himself, propping himself up like that. That's that's not good. Yeah, and, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, my arc was, you know, it's just, um, you know, it, and I lived for that economy with Obama, and it, you know, it was stable, but it didn't go anywhere. I mean, ah, man, Americans like see growth we need like to see a lot of jobs we like to see people prosper it wasn't that good 
during his his well, era. And, right, and I think the only way we can really move forward, right? There's a couple of issues I think most people have, and this is the reason Trump does well. And and it's not something he's invented or created. It's just because he, he's calling it out. He realizes that it's wrong and it's bad, and he's one of few people that are out there actually acknowledging that this is happening, is that the the regular built-in inflation that we have is brutal. Not Not the Biden inflation, just the regular inflation, right? The fact that at, there was a point in time where one spouse worked and other one didn't. They were able to buy a home. Some people bought two homes. They went on a vacation and they had, back in the days, they had four kids. That's become two kids for most families now. And, you know, limiting the vacations. I don't know how you send your kid to school when it's $200,000 for an education or close to it. So Trump is calling this stuff out, saying, you know, we want to make America great again. We're we're not going to tax tips. We're going to... uh, uh, allow people to make money, earn money, save money, invest that money, and buy a home. And that's fantastic. Harris is also saying people need to buy a home. The big difference here is that her version of buy a home is the, the government's going to give you the money for the down payment, right? And it's more government intervention, which means more inflation. <laughs> uh, Trump is talking about creating wage growth, right? Creating a, a robust economy, uh, having growth within the economy. And, and, and I think that's the difference, and that's what you're talking about. Without a robust economy that grows, people can't earn money and save money and invest. And, and home ownership, in my opinion, or at least re- owning real property, is the, the surest way that one can, A, protect themselves as a hedge against the future, right? You'll, you'll always make money on some sort of property, at least where I live. You know, if you buy a house in Jersey, New York, even in a bad neighborhood, it's going to go up. Nothing goes down around here. Maybe there's other places where it does, but here, that's the reality. So, Pat, I think you're uh, you're right. We, um, we we need a robust economy, and I think Americans are ready for it. What say you? I, I agree. I agree. I think we we have been sitting and waiting. I like I it's like hurry up and wait kind of situation. Yeah. And boy, that that should drive Americans crazy. Because we're a go-go country. I mean, we're a country that does things. This was a can-do country. We can still be that. We really can still be that. The mindset is there. It's just the willpower. We need the willpower. And you look at, listen to that one guy. It's um, in charge of disaster uh, planning for FEMA down there. I mean, he has no idea. He's, He's hating his job. And, you know, there, there's a, there are people in definite need, and we've got a government that does not take care of our people. And I'll tell you what, Donald Trump is mm-hmm. a – he is an anal kind of attentive kind of guy. He likes things perfect, and I tell you what, that's good for America. He will get – he is the guy. He's, he's considered a builder, right? I think all the bridges and the roads and the railroads – and the canals and all this stuff that are falling apart in this country are going to get fixed under Donald Trump because he'll get it done. He is great with the private sector. And guys like uh, Joe Biden are not. He is not good with the private sector. And he's got Leah Musk with him. And he's also got a guy that's uh, it's got a little bit more feeling, uh, you know, Joe Kennedy. I mean, he's going to help make this administration a great ministry. Oh, you mean RFK Jr. Yeah, I think you're right, uh, 100%. Uh, Trump's got the right people by his side. He's got the right message. Uh, it sounds like a winning ticket to me, uh, Vance and, and the rest of the team, Elon Musk, RFK. I mean, sounds like the Avengers, right? Pat, I want to thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Like always, thank you for streaming the show on richvaldez.com. And, folks, we come back with your calls and more. Que uh, mala eres, Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States. She did a town hall tonight uh, where I'm pretty sure she was controlling the questions with another friendly network, Univision, the Spanish network. We're going to find out what happened uh, with Que uh, mala eres at the Univision town hall tonight. Straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 833- 
for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, welcome back. We continue our conversation, and, you know, we like to talk about everything that's going on in America at night as it happens. And a little while ago, Que Malaeres wrapped up her town hall on Univision, the Spanish news network. And we have a couple of clips of what she said, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy them. In this one, she's asked, name one or two virtues that Donald Trump has. So she's asked to say something nice about Trump. Wait till you hear this word salad. Check it out. Carlos, could you please give me three virtues that... Could you pre- mention three virtues prior President Donald Trump? President Donald Trump has. So, thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me start with this. I, I basic, Based on a life experience, I know that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And part of what pains me is the approach that, frankly, Donald Trump and some others have taken, which is to suggest that it's us versus them, whoever that may be, and having Americans point fingers at each other, using language that's about belittling people and calling them names and meant to make them afraid and and live in fear. I don't think that's healthy for our nation, and I don't admire that. And, in fact, I'm quite critical of it, coming from someone who wants to be president of the United States. Um, I think he, um, I think Donald Trump loves his family, and I think that's very important. I think family is one of the most important things that we can prioritize. But I don't really know him, to be honest with you. I only met him one time on the debate stage. I'd never met him before. So I don't really have much more to offer you. (laughs) Hmm. Well, there you have it. Not much to offer. I don't know the guy. You know, I think she would have scored so many more points outside of her base with people that are on the fence. If she would have said, you know, um, you know, I, I think he's uh, he's been, uh, I don't know, come up with something. I like his hair. He's a sharp dresser. Something. He's a great dad. You know, you can't go wrong with that one. But she didn't. She went with, I don't really know. I don't really like him. I'm critical of him. And I, I only met him once on the debate stage. Cop and a plea. Didn't sound very impressive to me. Que mala eres. Not at all. So I want to know, what are your thoughts here? What are your thoughts on the issues we're talking about, the issues that you want to bring to the table? El trompito, que mala eres, and everybody else in between. You've got a lot of evil characters like AOC, all out crazy, our least favorite congresswoman from the Bronx and Queens. You've got... The um, probably one of the my favorite. Um, I, I don't like to use two of these bad guys, right? There's two bad guys out there. Uh, you got George Soros, you know, the uh, sugar daddy and Papi Chulo of the left, and then you've got the um, Klaus Schwab, the nutty professor, the evil scientist, right? Dr. Evil. And I can't stand either of these guys, but there, there's some of the bad guys in this cast of characters, and I want to get your thoughts on all of it. Let's go to Gary, Akron, Ohio, W-N-I-R. Gary, go for it. Good evening, Rich. Uh, I enjoy your talk radio station and all the uh, the advice you give us and the information across the country. But I'm very concerned about – I'm very concerned about what's happening – Behind the scenes with, um, I think it's iHeartRadio has 400 stations, and George Soros and his family are attempting to buy these stations, or at least about two or 300 of them, 
And if they do that, I'm concerned that people like yourself that are so valuable to us uh, to enlighten us and give us insight on what's happening will lose your your voice. And I'm not hearing anyone in the talk radio bring this subject up. And I just read an article where the FCC, I believe, is trying to uh, circumvent this and fast track it. And where's our Congress? And supposedly George Soros is, is a foreign based uh, person and he shouldn't have access to this. How yeah. We well, listen, this? Gary, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. We actually did talk about it on the show. Um, it, Congress had hearings about this last week. And they um, subpoenaed some people and they had many witnesses and people were testifying. And everything you're saying is accurate. Uh, the only thing, the, the only addition was it's not iHeartRadio, it's Odyssey. Um, and and you're right, I'm on uh, some Odyssey stations. And uh, I, I have no doubt that at some point they will get tired of me and dump me off their airwaves. But I, I'll say this. We invited the chairman, uh, excuse me, the commissioner, Brendan Carr of the Federal Communications Commission onto the program. And he graciously accepted our offer. And he's been on the show before and he is fighting this. Uh, He's alone in fighting it, but he is fighting it. The administration is trying to fast track it, uh, allowing more foreign investment than they typically allow. And they've pretty much greenlit this thing and it's gone through. I, I think where we're at now is trying to uh, reverse it if we if we're able to do so. And it's clear that they want to influence these stations and have this be part of their, um, I guess, you know, their final push to try and get Kamala Harris over the top. All I could say is this is one of those things where this is why we have to be involved. Right. This is why we need people in Congress. This is why we need people that are are generous and wealthy, uh, whether they're George Soros or not, to do what they feel is best with their with their funds. However, they want to do it. You got to be involved, whether it's knocking on doors, donating money, sounding the alarm like you are calling talk radio. It has to be done because if we don't do it, no one else will. Gary in Akron, Ohio. Thank you, sir. Shout out to you. I appreciate your kind words. Folks, we're coming right back with the speed round. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I hope your family is okay and your home is okay. First of all, I think I hope everything is okay. Your home is okay. Uh, every day she introduces a new accent. Que mala eres, living up to her name, how bad she is in Spanish. I hope your house is okay. Let's go to Paul. Paul in Zanesville, Ohio. I hope your house is okay. Paul, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, Rich, I, I didn't know what a pendejo was tonight until I Googled it. That was so funny. <laughs> but for Kamala Harris, yeah, to say that... If you're going to um, call her a pendeja, it has to end with an A. Yeah, Paul, I, I got to cut you off there. I'm sorry, brother. The the music means they're kicking us out, brother. But I appreciate hearing your voice. Big Tex in Amarillo, Texas. We will talk again mañana. Hasta la próxima. Don't go anywhere. God bless you. I'm Rich Valdez.